Iraq. A storm has just hit Iraq. It made hundreds of people injured. A horrifying storm has just beaten Iraq. What is going on? Is that a wrath of God or a sign of the end times? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. In the sky of Iraq, during hot summer storms, lightning is an unexpected but not strange phenomenon. Lightning flashed through the darkness, shaking the barren fields and tiny towns along the great Euphrat and Tigris rivers. On top of the hot sand mountains, lightning flashed, creating dramatic images amid dark clouds and hot air. During stormy days, thunderstorms hit the ground with incredible force, spreading fear and hope in people's hearts. The unusual... a spectacular slow-motion light show over the Houston skyline and the unusual burning sensation from the ground was drawn up by the hot sun, creating a humid and heavy atmosphere. Dense, dark clouds began to roll in the sky, seemingly a signal of impending fear. The storm came quickly and forcefully, with strong winds in tow. Sand and dust splashed in the air, creating a gloomy and unpleasant scene. In the fields of dry grass and brown trees, stormy winds pounded, shaking everything in its path. Thunder echoed in the distance like a warning of impending danger. Radiant lightning flashes through the darkness, shattering the silence and bringing a sense of chaos and terror. Showers. Muscat Governorate that were observed to be hit by strong storms include Al Mawale. Showers fell strongly from above soaking the ground and turning it into a maze of flood water. Major rivers such as the Euphrat and Tigris overflowed, causing flooding and chaos in riverside towns. However, let us reveal this to you. Before this terrible storm happened, a strange sound appeared in the Iraq sky. This sounds like a trumpet, and it was once heard and recorded on video by people in Australia. Please continue watching so we can reveal it slowly. The passing storm caused flooding. The heavy rain combined with the large amount of water from these rivers causes the water level to quickly exceed the safe level. Riverine towns and villages located along the Euphrat and Tigris rivers fell victim to the force of the floods. Homes, fields and infrastructure were flooded, causing extensive damage to the community. The daily lives of Iraq are turned upside down as they face risks such as losing their homes, losing their lives and losing property. Moving and providing relief becomes difficult with flooded land conditions and transportation problems. Shit! 
The aftermath of storms and floods in Iraq was a spectacle of destruction and hardship. After the storm passed and the flooding gradually increased, serious physical and mental consequences became apparent. In the hardest hit areas, houses and infrastructure were completely destroyed and fertile fields were flooded, sowing fear and despair in the hearts of people. Roads are divided, making movement and providing relief difficult. Let's pray together for Iraq, where storms and floods have swept through, bringing loss and pain to thousands of people. Pray for them to have strength and hope during these difficult times. Finally, please protect the people of Iraq so that they can go through this dark time with faith and hope. Amen. Returning to the weird sound, an Australian man is standing outside his home when some extremely loud trumpets can be heard coming from the sky amidst an incoming storm. This does not seem normal. Some people think this is the sound of the trumpet of judgment, or in other words, this is the sound of the end times. As the weird sound echoes through the air, an eerie feeling settles over the Australian man. He stands outside his home, gazing up at the darkening sky, where ominous clouds gather on the horizon. The trumpet's blaring seems to reverberate through his very bones, sending shivers down his spine. It's unlike anything he's ever heard before, and it fills him with an inexplicable sense of dread. Rumors and speculations begin to spread rapidly throughout the neighborhood. Some people whisper that these trumpet-like sounds are a sign of impending doom, a harbinger of the end times mentioned in religious texts. Others dismiss it as nothing more than a bizarre natural phenomenon, perhaps caused by atmospheric conditions or unusual acoustic reverberations. But for the Australian man, the sound feels too ominous to be easily dismissed. It seems to carry with it an otherworldly quality, a sense of foreboding that hangs heavy in the air. As the storm approaches, bringing with it the threat of fierce winds and torrential rain, he can't shake the feeling that there's something more to these trumpets than meets the eye. Despite the uncertainty and fear swirling around him, the Australian man finds himself drawn to the mysterious sound. With a mixture of trepidation and curiosity, he listens intently, searching for any clue as to its origin. Is it a warning, a divine message, or simply a natural anomaly? Only time will tell, but for now, the unsettling sound of the trumpets remains an enigma, haunting the skies above and stirring the imagination of all who hear it. When we hear a strange trumpet sound, Many people tend to associate it with end-time beliefs and beliefs. There are beliefs that the trumpets of judgment will be heard before the end of the world according to adherents of many different religions. When such an event happens, like the sound of trumpets over Iraq that day, it really makes people feel strange and worried. The feeling of strangeness is often accompanied by a sense of mystery and ignorance as to the cause of the trumpet sound. People can feel that there is something unusual, there may be a supernatural presence, or there is a special meaning behind those trumpet sounds. Feelings of anxiety and unease can spread through the community as people begin to wonder about the meaning of this event and whether it predicts something scary is about to happen. Whether one believes in reading and understanding religious signs or not, the appearance of mysterious phenomena, such as strange trumpet sounds, still causes strong and special emotions in people's minds. And God will return. Are you troubled about the things happening in the world? Nothing has gotten out of control. There are three categories of people, those who are afraid, those who don't know enough to be afraid, and those who know their Bibles. What is eschatology? It is theological study of Bible prophecies concerning the end of the world. So, what does the Bible say about the end times? The second coming of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, 8 It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You who are troubled, rest. Our Lord is on his way. 
the word revealed in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 is the word apocalypse. An apocalypse means an unveiling. Jesus' glory and majesty are veiled today, and he is despised, ridiculed, and made the butt of jokes. But people will one day see him as he is. The Bible says, This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Acts 1, 11b. The Son of God is coming literally, bodily, back to this earth. When is the second coming of Christ? But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Malachi 4, 2. Jesus' return is like the sunrise in two ways. You can't hurry it up and you can't stop it. It comes on time. What will happen at the second coming of Christ? 2 Thessalonians 1, 10a. He comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. When Jesus comes, we will be made like him. We will be dazzled at his transforming love. Think of those of us who were stubborn and unbelieving and then were reached by his grace. Think of those who were demonized by drugs, alcohol, pride and lust, ignorant and stumbling in darkness, who will now be made like the Lord Jesus. Is Jesus perfect? So will we be. Is Jesus prophet, priest and king? So will we be. We will look at that redeemed multitude and admire the Lord Jesus. You don't become like Jesus by doing good works, being baptized or giving money, only by believing in him. Who is going to admire the Lord Jesus when he comes again? Who will be transformed? Those who believe. And not one of them will be lost. False prophets and the Antichrist? False prophets. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, 2 Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Somebody had written a letter to the church in Thessalonica and signed Paul's name to it. It was a forgery saying, the day of the Lord is at hand, the rapture has taken place and you missed it. The Thessalonians were all troubled. So Paul said, don't be deceived. I didn't write that letter. As we get closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ, there will be a lot of quacks, charlatans and cults, and all kinds of things from God. Many false prophets will speak lies. That is all the more reason to open God's word and read it. Understand what God says, black print on white paper, interpreted by the Holy Spirit into your heart, so you can be ready for Christ when he comes. Paul explains in 2 Thessalonians what will happen in days to come, the Antichrist. After the rapture, Satan will fling one final insult into the face of God through his agent of blasphemy, the Antichrist. This Antichrist will be to Satan what Jesus is to God the Father. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2.3. What does the Bible say about the Antichrist? Different Bible translations call him the man of lawlessness, the incarnation of wickedness, the champion of wickedness, or wickedness in human form. But Revelation 13 calls him the beast and the Antichrist. The prefix anti means two things, against and instead of. Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. John 5.43 And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians 2.6.7 Paul is saying there is a demonic conspiracy against mankind called the mystery of lawlessness. Read the news, see the entertainment, listen to the philosophies of this world. There is an ungodly force working. 
But Paul also says there is something currently holding back the ungodly force, the rapture of the church. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to help the saints, but also to hinder Satan. Satan is on a leash now, but when the church is taken out, all hell will break loose. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7b. What will be taken out? The church at the rapture and the Holy Spirit who indwells the church. The church is salt and light. Read Matthew 5, 13, 16. Salt cleanses, decontaminates and preserves. When the salt is taken out of this earth, there will be rottenness, filth and stench like never seen before. When we are gathered together at the rapture to meet Jesus in the air, darkness and error will encircle the globe as this Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, comes to rule. Christ's return will happen in two phases. First, he will come secretly for the church, his bride. Then he will come back with his bride as King of kings and Lord of lords, the reign of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Christ will consume the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth, that is, with his word. This speaks of the battle of Armageddon when heaven will be opened and the saints will come with Christ. Revelation 19.15 says that out of Jesus' mouth will go a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. The battle will be over. Christ will sit upon the throne, and the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 9b. Revelation 22:20. 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. If you are not excited about Jesus Christ coming again, you are too much in love with this world and not enough in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. List of scriptures referenced in this article. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, 10, 2, 1, 3, 6, 8, Acts 1, 11, Malachi 4, 2, John 5, 43, Matthew 5, 13, 16, Revelation 19, 15, 22, 20, Isaiah 11, 9. More Bible verses about end times prophecy. 2. John 1, 7, 11. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. 2. Peter 1, 20 b 21. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 24, 23, 25. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. The second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the church, the grand climax of the gospel. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected, and together with the righteous living will be glorified and taken to heaven, but the unrighteous will die. The almost complete fulfillment of most lines of prophecy, together with the present condition of the world, indicates that Christ's coming is near. The time of that event has not been revealed, and we are therefore exhorted to be ready at all times. The second coming is not a secret for only the most educated, or a prize for the rich. It's not metaphorical or symbolic, or only happening on a spiritual plane, as once believed by many Christian communities. It is and will be a literal event described in Scripture. Jesus will descend on a cloud. The righteous dead will rise from their graves and up to the cloud with Jesus. The righteous living will rise up to the clouds with Jesus and always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, 17 ESV.
Adventists believe this in its straightforward terms. Jesus will return on a cloud, staying in the sky. He will not set foot on the ground. The dead in Christ will rise up with him, and those living will soon follow, as we're all caught up together in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, 4, ESV. Acts 1.11, when an angel was addressing Jesus' disciples after they witnessed his ascension, also confirms the visible manner of his return. He will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven, ESV. Jesus' return is about reuniting himself with us. In John 14, he informed his disciples he was ascending back to heaven, but he would be preparing a place for us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. John 14, 3, ESV. Not only will we be called up to the clouds with Jesus, but we'll be with him forever. Philippians 3.20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, ESV. Even if someone hasn't yet made the decision to follow Jesus, he is always ready for us to come to him so he can bring as many of his children with him to heaven as possible. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. Revelation 3.20 Revelation 1, 7 says, Every eye shall see him. ESV We will not have to guess or wonder if this is really Jesus or not. No matter where we are, we'll be able to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 24, 30 ESV Before his crucifixion, Jesus told the high priest, From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Matthew 26, 64, ESV. Jesus will be visible to all, those who hurt him, those who choose to believe in him, and those who don't. The second coming will not be something anyone can miss. Through the Bible, we can see the second coming is not only a literal event, but a global event. Just as referenced in the section above, Every eye will see him, no matter the time zone, continent, etc. It's hard to imagine something like this, but with God, nothing is impossible. We're told, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Luke 17.22 ESV We will also be able to hear the trumpet calls and victory shouts of the angels who will accompany Jesus when he returns. No one knows the day or the hour of the second coming. Though Jesus was clear that he would return, he also explained that the details for when it would happen are not ours to know. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Matthew 24, 36 ESV Not even the angels know the day Jesus will return. This is similar to how Noah knew the rain would come, but not the exact moment it would begin. God warned Noah that he would send a flood to destroy the corruption on earth, Genesis 6. Noah knew the rain would come, but did not know when it would begin. Like the flood in Genesis, no creature in existence will know when Christ will return, but we know he will. Throughout his ministry, Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for his departure, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, as well as his second coming. To prepare them, Jesus used parables for lessons and examples. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Matthew 25, 1 ESV. In the story Jesus tells, there are five virgins who are wise and five who are foolish. All ten gather to wait for the bridegroom to arrive so they can enter the wedding feast. The wise bring extra oil for their lamps, and the foolish bring none. Before the bridegroom arrived, those who brought no oil for their lamps had to go buy more. While they were gone, the bridegroom came. The wise virgins got to go into the wedding feast. 
When the five foolish virgins returned, they could not go in. V1, 12 ESV. Jesus finishes his warning by telling them, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. V13 ESV. It is not for us to know, because our job is not to focus on when it's happening. Our task is to keep our eyes on Jesus, take the Great Commission to heart, and live as a walking testimony, knowing that Jesus will indeed come to save us and put an end to sin and evil forever. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Matthew 24, 4, 5, ESV. No one knows when the events of the second coming will occur, no one but God the Father. This means anyone who claims to know is either mistaken or seeking to manipulate. The author of Revelation, John, writes of his vision of Christ's return. He says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. V. 7. ESV. In Revelation 14, he recounts other images from his vision. John included in this vision the Lamb standing on Mount Zion with 144,000, a number to represent those believers who stand with Jesus at the end of time on earth, V1. This vision continues until John sees Jesus on a white cloud. On a cloud, he descends to earth with a sickle in his hand, and he swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped, V16 ESV. In vivid word pictures and poetry, the Bible tells of the triumphant coming of Christ in Revelation. Chapter 19, John says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. V11. The heavens will open like a crowd parting for royalty, and Christ will appear on a white horse as a conquering king. He brings heavenly armies with him and will keep his promise to redeem and to judge. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. V. 12. Jesus' eyes pierce through to our hearts where we can hide nothing from him. He doesn't wear one crown, but many, as he is the king of kings. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God, V. 13. Jesus' victory is displayed on his garment. While some believe the blood on his robe is the blood of his enemies, it is more likely the blood represents his victory at Calvary. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Vol. 14. When Jesus comes, he will lead an army of heavenly beings, also riding white horses and wearing clean, pure white robes. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.